Grace and peace to you from God our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God this morning. I thank God for you people of faith. The God who truly reigns has lavished you with grace. With that in mind, I have a question for you. What is the most important thing God wants to accomplish in your life on this earth? Think about that. Let me pose some options for you. They're on the screen. I'll just read through those. Make you a good person. Enable you to be a light to the world. Have, have you reproduce other Christians. Make you his for eternity. Get you to be a good, solid church member. Help you be all that you can be. Or something else in that list. I'm going to investigate what came to your mind. So what's the most important thing God wants to accomplish in your life here on earth? I'm going to run through those. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand for the one that you chose. No, just, just one, okay? Make you a good person. Enable you to be the light to the world. Help you reproduce other Christians. Make you his for eternity. Get you to be a good, solid church member. Help you to be all that you can be. And about 50% of you, I don't think, raised your hands for any of those. What would be your answer? <laughs> well, at some time in the past, you were called to contrition or remorse for your sins by the law of God. And you were called to faith in Jesus by the gospel. So what did, God, what did God accomplish in you? You became his. You became his. You became a rescued sinner, saved by God's grace. He put you on the path to eternal life. I tell you, based on the Bible, that is God's primary goal for you, primary desire for you. He wants you to be his for eternity. All those things on that list, that's the one. That's his priority. In fact, none of the other things on that list can happen until you are his, saved by grace, saved by grace. You weren't always a rescued sinner. You were spiritually dead. You were lost, as Jim said to the kids. As a spiritually dead person, what couldn't you do? In that condition, we were not capable. We were not capable of calling out to God or reaching out to him or standing in his presence. In fact, we had no interest in doing so. But our Father God had other plans for us. The eternal God, who's the Father of all humanity, breathed into us the breath of life through his word, through the work of the Holy Spirit. He would not let our sins sweep us away into eternal damnation. He entered into us with this miraculous coming, coming into you. His kingdom came and engulfed you inside and out. You were brought into his kingdom. God rescued you from Satan's kingdom and brought you into the kingdom of the son he loves, the kingdom of his son. That's why you are a person of faith that you are today. He came to you. What a blessing, right? You, my friends, are wonderfully blessed, and I thank God that you are now people of faith by God's grace in Christ Jesus. God's number one priority for you is having you in his kingdom forever. Your number one priority is hanging on to God, hanging on to your Savior with trust and love. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's us. Make him the priority of our lives, hanging on to him and trusting him firmly. Stay strong in faith, depending totally on God's grace. The righteousness in which we stand before God in the judgment comes from his gift for us. Jesus' righteousness, it's not our works, it's not our righteousness, it's God, Jesus' righteousness given to us as God's gift, when we, which we grasp 
in faith. If we don't arrive at heaven's door in faith, trusting Jesus is not because God wasn't faithful. God is faithful. If we don't get there in faith, it's because we've succumbed to the lure of this world or the lure of Satan or the lure of our sinful nature and pulled away from God's love. You know some people like that, don't you, who have pulled away from God's love. I thank God that now you are people of faith. But I have a question for you. Are those closest around you people of faith? People trusting God? Trusting God's gospel promises? Trusting Jesus as their Savior? You've received God's grace through faith, trusting. As the scripture says, 1 John 5, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. With the Son of God, you have life. Those who do not have the Son of God do not have life. Jesus proclaimed, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. Do you hear that? No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. If a person's religion doesn't hang on to Jesus in faith, to be saved from the destruction that they deserve, that person has the wrong religion, the wrong beliefs. If your family members, other close to you, aren't hanging on to Jesus in faith as the only way to be saved from the punishment that we all deserve, their, that their sins deserve, then they have the wrong religion, the wrong beliefs. And many of you know people who are close to you who have those wrong beliefs. They do not yet know and trust the way, Jesus. Many of you long for that day when someone who's close to you expresses that firm trust in Jesus that you have. Jesus, you are my Savior. I thank God that you have that desire. You have that passion, longing for faith in those around you. Note this well. Just knowing about Jesus is not enough. One must trust Jesus as his or her own personal Savior. Let me illustrate that concept of trust with a little anecdote from the work of a Bible translator. The translator and his team were struggling. You know, you can imagine this. They're trying to figure out what word in this language that we're translating the Bible into expresses that full meaning of the trust, trust, depending on. And after a long study of the words of that language, they could not find a single word that would express trust the way we understand it, total confidence in God. But then it was that a team member who had been standing, they were sitting around, one person was standing, he sat on his stool, and insight struck the translator. What was in this team member's mind, or what was in this team member when he sat down on that stool? Think about that. Complete trust. Trust in that stool. Trust that that stool would hold him up. When you sat on the pew this morning, did you question, is it going to hold me up if I sit on it? Probably not, right? You just sat on it. You had confidence that pew was going to hold you up. You had complete trust, complete trust in that pew. Well, that's the concept of trust in Jesus. You have confidence in him. You trust him. You're willing to put your full weight on him. You're willing to put his lo your life on him. You have complete confidence that he paid for your sin. You have complete confidence that your sins are forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. You have complete confidence that because of him, you will be with God in eternity. Notice complete confidence. You are in faith trusting him for your eternal salvation. Faith trusts the Savior, the rescuer, as the only way to eternal life with God. Let me stop right there and urge you to express your trust, your confidence in Jesus as the only way to eternal life with God. You can do it with the words that are on the screen 
or you put it in your own words, tell Jesus you trust him as your Savior. Allah, Buddha, Mother Earth, and other false gods are not the way. Native spirits aren't the way. Worshiping self isn't the way. Materialism isn't the way. Movie stars, music stars, sports stars aren't the way to heaven. There's only one way for eternity in God's presence, and there's, that's none other than Jesus, the Son of God, who is our Savior, our personal rescuer, the rescuer who is eager to save everyone. There's something about people who don't know Jesus as their Savior that we need to consider. They do not have a prayer. Now, it's not that they don't have hope, because there is hope for them. Jesus died for them, right? Jesus died for their sins, too. They don't have a prayer because no one's praying for them. And as people who follow the devil, and they do, if you're not following God, the person is following the devil. They're not praying for themselves, right? And as people who are following the devil, they're not praying for themselves, and in fact, most unbelievers do not have anyone else praying for them. Thus, they do not have a prayer. They probably do not have a prayer unless some Christian is praying for them. Right? Will you pray for them in faith, faithfully, so they have a prayer? Will you? Jesus gave us instructions about how to pray. You know, he said in Greek, Pater hemon haunt hoist ugonois, our Father in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as in, as in heaven. Did you notice a particular petition there that is especially pertinent in the season of Advent and Christmas? Thy kingdom come. Advent and Christmas is that season of coming, Jesus coming. Of course, Jesus came to this world some 2,000 years ago. And Jesus' presence brought the kingdom of God to this world. Often in the Gospels, we see Jesus speaking about, the kingdom of God is here. Now, God, God of course, reigned throughout the Old Testament era, certainly. But Jesus brought his kingdom to this world in a very special way, in a glorious display with awesome love. When we pray, thy kingdom come, there are several other meanings which Pastor Peck and I are preaching about during this Advent season. So what are we praying? I'm just going to review them fairly quickly here. It certainly is appropriate for us to pray for the coming of God's kingdom of glory when Jesus comes again, as it does at the end of the book of Revelation. Then this time-bound age will end, this earth will disappear, but the eternal age will continue. On All Saints Day, we talked about Jesus coming and the judgment. We examined our failures, and our, when we stand before the judgment seat, we're going to be ushered in. Why? Because our sins are washed away. We've been given the righteousness of Jesus. Thy kingdom come. A couple weeks ago, we explored this heaven-bound journey toward heaven, and we prayed, Lord God, keep us on that path to heaven. So we pray for God to come again, Jesus, come again. Come with that kingdom of glory. When Jesus comes again, that kingdom of glory will be totally established, and those in faith trusting Jesus will be ushered into his kingdom, and those without faith will be sent to their eternal torment. When Jesus comes again, excuse me, we can pray, thy kingdom come with that meaning. Come again, Lord, come again, and take us to live with you. However, thy kingdom come can also be a prayer for ourselves that God would come into us more fully, that he would reign in our lives, rule in our lives, and that our self-rule would be squashed down. We are in the kingdom of God, right? As Christians, we're in the kingdom of God, but we still fight against God's rule in our lives, don't we? So when we pray, thy kingdom come, we're praying, keep coming, take the rule of my life, squash my sinful nature. That's the second coming. That's the second meaning of thy kingdom come. And there's another meaning. Thy kingdom come is also a prayer that God would come into the lives of those who do not yet know him as Savior. Namely, it has kingdom of grace would engulf them 
as it did us. And that's the focus today. Praying for those who are not yet in the kingdom of God. Every time we pray that prayer, we're praying for the lost, really. Thy kingdom come. It's my father, my aunt, my neighbor. What an important prayer. Father, save my father. Save my aunt. Save my neighbor. There are lots of lost people for whom to pray. According to research by the Barna Organization, across the United States, fewer than 25% of all Americans trust in Jesus as their Savior and only hope of eternal life. Do you hear that? Fewer than 25, fewer than one out of four. There are lots of people who are lost. They need our prayers. The kingdom of God would come to them. There are lots of people in our personal networks, right, whose paths we cross frequently, who are not yet in the kingdom of God. Lots of people lost in our state, our county, and probably we're not too far off that average here in Jenison and surrounding communities, in spite of the fact we have a dozen churches down Baldwin Street here. There are many who claim to be Christian, think of themselves as Christian. In fact, in the United States, about 83%, according to that same research, think of themselves as Christian, but they're not because they do not trust in Jesus as their Savior. Their idea of Christianity is something different. We won't get into all those options today, but they do not depend on Jesus for their salvation. They do not depend on him for their eternal security. Saving faith is more than knowing about Jesus. It's more than trying to live a good life. Saving faith trusts in Jesus as the Savior, the Rescuer, and the only way to return to with God. That's God's word from the Bible. Let me urge you in this season to pray frequently for those closest to you who do not have Jesus. In fact, do it all year, okay? During this Christmas season, of course, people have a heightened awareness of Jesus. Christmas music in stores, and secular, even secular radio stations have that mixture of Christian music and, and secular music. Signs will broadcast, Jesus is the reason for the season. He is. There's no Christmas without Christ. However, while thousands in our community will be exposed to that name of Jesus, most need to hear the real truth, the message that you believe. Jesus is the Savior of all humanity. We need to go beyond hearing. They need to go beyond hearing and stop rejecting and instead trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. They need to have what you people of faith have, a firm, ongoing trust in Jesus as their Savior, their Rescuer, and the only way to eternity with God. Jesus is the only way to avoid separation from God, to avoid hell, the despair and the torment there. At present, many of them do not have a prayer. That, my friend, is a wonderful opportunity we have. Will you make a list of those closest to you? You know, family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, etc. There's an insert in your order of worship this morning. Gives you some ideas there, but there's several lines. You can probably fill up the backside of that page as well of people that you know. We write those down, write those names, include people on your electronic media networks as well. People you can pray for, people with whom you have some contact. Then will you regularly pray for them? Pray that they will know the truth. Pray that the Spirit of God would touch their hearts with his power. Pray that the kingdom of God would come to them. Pray specifically, Lord, bring my brother John and Aunt Jennifer into your kingdom of grace. God, I pray that the message of Christ, the Savior, is born, would take on new meaning for Bob and Rebecca and their kids. Lord God, put your good news into the ears and eyes of my coworker. Ralph and Bill, in a way that conveys the message to their hearts so that they truly believe it. Gracious God, I pray that my Uncle Terry would recognize the consequence of, of sin in our lives and know that he needs a Savior and that you provided that Savior, Jesus. Help him, help him to trust Jesus completely. You have a prayer. You can pray like that, right? 
Make sure those people closest to you have that prayer, your prayer for them. Pray thy kingdom come. Here's a real life story about a woman who was praying, a teacher, Joanne Wilson, who was praying for a fellow teacher, Sally. Joanne was praying for Sally, but she was also praying for herself, that she would be able to share her faith with Sally sometime, and that she'd be willing to invite Sally to church. Well, several months earlier, Joanne had gotten Sally to let her first-grade son come to a children's event at the church. But while Joanne had been praying for Sally, she had not yet asked her. So one Sunday morning, Joanne got a phone call. Well, it was from the school secretary. Secretary asked Joanne what the time for the service was. And whoa, Sally thought, I haven't been praying for her, but here she's calling me asking me about when churches. Surprised but pleased, she gave her the church time and said, you know, can we meet at the door and can we sit together? And after saying that, the secretary said, by the way, I asked Sally to come with me, and her son won't let her say no. He wants to go to Mrs. Wilson's church. His mother is coming too. So God works in wonderful ways, doesn't he? Not all prayers will have that same result. But praying for the unsaved is certainly a loving and godly thing to do. As a reminder of people you're praying for, use this insert again. Use it. Put it somewhere where you're going to see it on a regular basis. And be reminded frequently to pray. God has given you faith to trust him and to trust the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus. And trust Jesus as your Savior. You have a precious gift, a treasured gift, a gift that others need. As you probably know, people who don't usually go to worship are much more likely to go to church at Christmas or Easter than any other time of the year. And they're also much more likely to go if it's a friend who invites them or someone close to them even if you aren't a friend, if you're close to them. Will you invite someone, someone that you're praying for? That personal invitation is important, but you could use this also as you got one of those coming in this morning. It's a gift that's going out to all of our neighbors here, but we'd like you to take not only this card, there are going to be lots more at the door, take a half a dozen of these. Think about people that you want to invite by giving them one of these invitations to join us in our Christmas worship. Next Sunday for our Christmas concert service and Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, be the one who invites them with that. Of course, your verbal encouragement is very important in that. But what else can we do to bring a Christian witness into the lives of those around us? Let me give you some options here. Throw holy water on their house. Be nice. Show a little love. Share the gospel of Jesus with them. Keep your distance from him or her. Just talk about God and Jesus and your confidence in them. Give him or her some Christian novels. Build a friendship. What would be your favorites on that list? Which would be the most influential on them? There are several positive things you can do there and a couple things not to do. So what's your favorite? Can you do some of those? Ask God to give you the courage to do some of those, okay? We, they're Christian friends. Your neighbors, your coworkers, your relatives. We are the love that they need. We are the witnesses they need. And we have the prayers they need. May the kingdom of God come to you, come through you, to all those around you. Amen. Amen.